Hello and welcome back to Insight. Now we're here in London, but recently it was a galaxy far, far away that stole all the headlines yet again. The success of Rogue One proved that there is money to be made in old movie magic, something we also saw with Fantastic Beasts, of course. I went down to the premiere of Rogue One to find out why the force is still strong with the mega movie franchises. The launch of Rogue One may have been a touch on the dark side, but everyone knew they were marching towards pretty much a guaranteed hit. And that has less to do with the stars of the film themselves and more to do with the sheer force of the mega franchise. You know, just being here, you can already sense the excitement in the air, although I think it's fair to say that even before tonight's massive premiere here in London, or indeed before Rogue One was unleashed in cinemas, the hype for this film has been stronger than Darth Vader himself. I think it's probably fair to say that Disney were never going to need Jedi mind tricks to get us all flocking into the cinemas. I do it to protect you. So you understand? I understand. Rogue One took about $150 million in its opening weekend in the States. That's the second highest December opening ever, just behind a certain film called The Force Awakens last year. You may be spotting a theme here. For Disney then, the gamble of turning Star Wars into a multi-dimensional cinematic universe seems to have paid off. This is a kind of standalone film. It both respects the Star Wars heritage, but it's also doing something quite different, kind of breaking the mold in many ways. It's got a lot of grit and edge to it, so yeah, hopefully there's something there for everyone. Of course, it's not just Star Wars and Rogue One that are changing the whole way we perceive these mega movie franchises. Over the last year, of course, we've had the same with Marvel's massive, ever-expanding portfolio of films. And of course, Harry Potter have also conjured up a similar spell, expanding their world from just one series of books and films into its own cinematic universe. Hey, Mr. English guy, I think your egg is hatching. You wiped his memory, right? The no magic. The what? No magic. The non-wizard. Sorry, we call them muggles. There's no doubt the Harry Potter execs at Warner Brothers took cues from the success of Marvel and Star Wars when they waved their wand to come up with a new potion to get Potter addicts back into the cinemas. Cynics, of course, groaned when it was announced Fantastic Beasts was being expanded into five separate films instead of three. But the presence of creator J.K. Rowling as scriptwriter hopefully means it's not just designed as a spell to conjure up more cash. So. You gotta get with the case full of monsters, huh? Use travels first. I said no to doing anything in the wizarding world for nine years. I probably said no to a thousand people who literally who wanted to do different things with the world and I just didn't want to do anything. And at the back of my mind was this, because I knew Warner Brothers had optioned Fantastic Beasts and I knew there was a story to tell there. In a way, these mega movie franchises are kind of behaving a bit like billion dollar soap operas with their ever expanding storylines and multiple character narratives. And in the same way that the internet has kind of changed the way that we consume knowledge and we kind of want to know everything about every minor detail, it's also slowly changing the way that we consume cinema. And it's a trend that's just going to grow over the coming years. Tom Cruise's reboot of The Mummy isn't just hoping to be 2017's big summer hit. It's also the start of what Universal hopes will be its own money-spinning monster cinematic universe, with new versions of Dr. Jekyll, Dracula and Frankenstein all following and popping up in each other's films. You're rebels, aren't you? Which means more movies with more characters and more backstories to remember. Or heading towards maybe one mega franchise mashup where we see the X-Men battle with Darth Vader and the Avengers and Spider-Man and Deadpool and Harry Potter in tow. Well, maybe not quite yet. I don't know about that. I think they're, I don't ever think they're going to want to share their money-making um, tra gravy trains. I don't think they're ever going to want to share that. Do you? No. No. Um, Maybe when people get really tired of superhero movies, they'll do it as one last ditch desperate attempt yeah. uh, to kind of milk the cow dry. But uh, but I don't know. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think I'd want it well, anyway. Watch that happen like next year. <laughs> yeah, I know. Coming next <laughs> We're summer. Like, wah, wah. And Craig joins me again now. I think it's fair to say the world's number one Star Wars geek. I'll go with that. I'll go with that. I think it's a fair comment. Um, in, in that case, then, what do you think about the return of these massive, massive franchises? Because, frankly, the $4 billion Disney spent 
I'm buying the Star Wars saga, seems worth it. Uh, completely. Uh, you know what, $4 billion well spent. I think a lot of people at the time were sort of going, really? After the prequels that George Lucas made uh, back in the late 90s, I think a few people were like, I don't know where we can go with Star Wars anymore. But they've done it. They've got Rogue One, we've got Episode 7 that was just a phenomenon last year. Eight and nine are on the way as well. We've got a Han Solo uh, movie on the way as well. I think Disney paid $4 billion uh, well worth it. When you're looking at the Star Wars coming back, we've also got Harry Potter, of course, coming back in the form of Fantastic Beasts. How much reliance do these studios need on these, these cash cows for a new generation? Well, I remember at the end of the Harry Potter run, Warner Brothers were like, well, what do we do now? And now we need somewhere else to go. And they found it with J.K. Rowling creating Fantastic Beasts. The interesting thing about that is that it was originally talked about only making three movies. It's already been stretched into five. Did you get that news and raise an eyebrow this year when you heard that she was going to turn it into five films? I mean, is it not maybe pushing the point that this story isn't worth that many movies? Well, they did it with the, with the Hobbit films. They did it with Lord of the Rings. Everything gets cut into as many movies as humanly possible. But you know what? If the subject is right, if the story is there as well, I think it can work. I think it's all about whether J.K. Rowling can create these characters and they can keep it lasting. But you know what the difference is? No matter what they do in these movies, the same with Star Wars, we will still go see them. They win every time. Okay, we've come inside now off of the cold streets, the much more comfortable and warm surroundings of the screening room with Jane and Craig here to talk about the tough decision of what their top five movies of the year have been. So guys, let's take a look at your top five list. Jane, let's start with yours. Mm -hmm. Five. Uh, well, I've got a number five, Nocturnal Animals. At four, Hell or High Water at three, Bridget Jones's Baby, at two, Deadpool, and my number one is La La Land. No surprise, but Bridget Jones's Baby, as we heard you talking about it earlier in there as well, and Deadpool. Craig, take us through your top five. Um, I've got uh, another Marvel movie in my list, number five, Captain America Civil War, number four, Arrival, number three, along with Jane, I've got Nocturnal Animals, La La Land, I decided to put a number two, but only because I am a huge Star Wars fan and it lives up to expectations. Rogue One is at number one. I do feel that you've talked a lot about Rogue One and Star Wars uh, in this show, so we won't go there, but let's look at that movie that you've both put in your top fives right at the top as well. A movie which I think we'll be talking about a lot over the coming months with the awards, and that is La La Land. Let's take a quick look at the movie. the decorations. Good luck in the new year. I just heard you play and I want to... So what is it you think is the magic of La La Land? Because it's kind of old school Hollywood, it's a musical, got very, very popular actors in it. It just seems to be this sort of massive molding pot of everything that's perfect about a film. Well, it's exactly that. It's singing, dancing, dream sequences. It's all about inside Hollywood, outside Hollywood, love, romance, heartbreak. It literally ticks off the list of what an Academy Award uh, should, should be looking for. It, it is literally the voters' dream, I think, this. Mm. And a critic's dream, and I think an audience's dream as well. Another movie which is in both of your top fives is Tom Ford's movie. It's very beautiful to look at, of course. You wouldn't expect anything less from Tom Ford, and that is Nocturnal Animals. Let's take a look at just how pretty that film is. I feel like your life has turned into something you never intended. I'm worried about you. Were you sleeping? You scared me the last time we talked. You know me. I never sleep. So what is the magic for both of you about this film? Is it the plot, is it the acting, is it the way it looks? It's a real slow burner, it really builds up momentum and, and by the end of it you're absolutely flawed. Um, but also it's just precision crafted, everything about it is perfect. Um, it's gorgeous to look at and beautifully written, everything about it is just 
spot on, isn't it? It's an education intention as well. The first 20 minutes, it's uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson is just, mm. uh, he's phenomenal in this, absolutely phenomenal. He's scary, he's uncomfortable, he's evil. He's just not Aaron Taylor Johnson. But it's just something about the filmmaking. And as you said, uh, it, it, when you described it, it is just beautiful. You could pause it at any particular moment and it would just be the most beautiful picture. I want to move away slightly from the list now that you've got as we head towards, well, we're already wading into awards season. We've had a couple take place already. The nominations, of course, for the Golden Globes are out not too far away now. Let's check out a movie that's gonna feature quite prominently in those awards as we head towards it, and that's Manchester by the Sea. Let's take a quick look at that. With you and you knew you'd be safe because he was the best man. He was gonna keep you happy. If it was between me and your father, who would you take? My daddy. I think you're wrong about that. What's quite interesting, I think, about Manchester by the Sea is people may have watched the trailer and maybe won't have quite an idea of what the actual film will be like. It's quite different, isn't it, Jane? Yeah, I mean, the trailer looks like it's a comedy, as though it's, you know, a guy and his, uh, this kid that are thrown together and what's going to happen. But actually, it's a really harrowing and bleak um, and emotional journey that is actually quite difficult to watch. It's something that you watch and you feel good about having sat through it and you feel like you've earned something from watching it, but it's not something that you're necessarily going to rush in to, to watch again. I, I was going to say exactly the same. It's, it's getting a lot of people's attention, and I think it will do very well come awards seasons, but I don't think it's that, hey, it's Friday night, let's go to the movies. Is Manchester by the Sea? I think it's that film that you, you feel you should watch. Let's move on to another movie which is inevitably taking a lot of headlines in the run-up to these awards, and that's because of the fact that this marks Mel Gibson's return to the director's chair, and this is Hacksaw Ridge. The plot of this film, of course, a true story, a conscientious objector, Desmond T. Doss from uh, World War II, so he went into battle without a gun. I mean, that alone is quite an interesting tell. Is it going to work as a film that people want to go and see, Jane? I mean, people love Mel Gibson's movies. They've, they've given him great box office for the films he's done before, and this is, you know, as good as anything he's done before, if not better. And if you're uh, interested in war, it depicts war in a really gruelling, raw and gritty way. It's gory and it's unflinching. But at the heart of that is this really quite amazing true story of this guy who went into this battle with just his, his medical kit and he saved loads of people's lives and he didn't take a gun. I mean, it's quite incredible. So it's uplifting, but it's also um, accurate to what actually happened. OK, so those are some of the films that we think might be in the awards. I'm going to force you, though, to call it. What do you guys think is going to win Best Picture? I think it's going to be La La Land. I'm with Jane every step of the way. La La Land. Clean sweep. No surprises there, guys. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, busy awards season ahead, of course. Golden Globes are on January the 8th, the BAFTAs February the 12th, and the 89th Academy Awards are on February the 26th. That's it from this edition of Insight. We're going to leave you now with a quick look at the movies that you'll be enjoying over the next 12 months. Goodbye. Peter, what is going on with you? I'm really sorry. I'm so busy. I'm slammed. Things were simpler then.